Hello friends, James Corbett here with your thought for the day, January 11th, 2017, and I really hoped that we could simply move past all this ridiculous nonsense about the Russia hack the election and all of this craziness that's swirling around in the run-up to the inauguration next week, but... It is still here, as evidenced by the bastion of fake news itself, Google News and its uh, assortment of fake news outlets like New York Times, NPR, USA Today, and all the rest, that still continue to put this Russian hacking at the top and front and center every single day, putting it before the brainwashed masses every single day, day in and day out, part of the 24-7 news feed, and it just keeps getting more and more ridiculous. And as always, let's look at the actual sources of information that are coming out here, as opposed to the interpretations of those sources of information, because there has been some releases that have been largely hyped in the fake news over the past several days, including the December 29th joint analysis report from the FBI and the DHS, which seemed, again, like another authoritative nail in the coffin of this whole election scam. Clearly, it was the Russians hacking, because look at this joint analysis report. Report, which is talking about grizzly step, Russian malicious cyber activity. And again, it looks authoritative. It looks very impressive if all you do is glance at it briefly or read a headline about it. But if you actually look at the report itself, well, it starts with a standard boilerplate disclaimer, or so they say for these joint analysis reports. This report is provided as is for informational purposes only. The DHS does not provide any warranties of any kind regarding any information contained within. Well, I'll take that to the bank. Uh, so anyway, taking that into account, let's look at what is actually presented here. If you go and look at the nuts and bolts of this report, essentially what we have is a very, again, imp very impressive looking graphic that purports to show what actually happened when they're talking about quote unquote hacking the election. What do they actually mean? Well, there's a few different things going on here, and essentially, you have some sort of malicious computer so server somewhere sending out an email with a malicious link going to a recipient, who then clicks on that link and gets a website that looks legitimate, and he enters his c credentials in there, which then go back to that server, which then uses those credentials to access targeted systems and use malicious files and move through and gather information and exfiltrate that data back to the original server. This is spear phishing, and this is essentially, as far as anything that we can tell about what happened to John Podesta, this is what happened to Podesta. This is how we got the Podesta emails, and this is verified and corroborated by uh, testimony from others, including uh, server administrators that uh, Podesta had corresponded to who accidentally told him, yes, this looks legitimate. He meant to say illegitimate. That's the official story anyway, and they're sticking to it. And so he entered his credentials in, and, and uh, well, we know that his emails got exfiltrated back to the server. But the whole link here, the important part of this is this part. Adversary space, Russian intelligence services, grisly step, leverages this operational infrastructure. Now, all of this, again, can be corroborated. We know that something like this clearly did happen. We have nothing, absolutely nothing that we can go on to get this part. All we are getting is this nice graphic that shows it's these damn Russians in their hoodies sitting there on their laptops that are doing all of this behind the scenes. But this, this number one is kind of the most important part in all of this. And again, there is absolutely no data provided here. We do have a list of different names, alternate names for these uh, Russian military and civilian intelligence services that uh, apparently these, these teams go by. But again, this is literally just a list of code names that could have been made up by anyone at any time. Who knows what's behind them? They do show a little bit of the code that is apparently part of the Yara signature in, involved with these indicators of compromise accompanying the CSV and uh, STIX files of JAR 1620926. But again, this PHP code itself doesn't tell us anything in particular about who did this. And as always with these types of things, even if there are indicators of things that we have in the past attributed to Russian intelligence, well, of course, if you're going to try to fake something to make it look like Russian intelligence, you would just insert the same or similar code or use similar types of, uh, of programs. So again, this attribution all relies on essentially this image that 
just asks you to believe this is Russians in hoodies sitting on laptops. And uh, and then the rest of the report itself is just about what to do to try to mitigate this and don't let your you know servers get compromised. So again, absolutely not a shred of anything resembling evidence in this report if you actually read it. But of course, they're expecting you not to actually read it. Uh, look at the the Office of the Director of National Intelligence just released their declassified version of their intelligence community assessment of Russian activities and intentions in recent U.S. elections back on uh, January 6th. And I have no doubt that you have seen many a news story about this release of this exceptionally important report. The same report, we are told, that was given to President-elect Trump in congressional leadership. And President Obama. Well... Wow, this this is an authoritative report. It represents the com combined and collective assessment of the intelligence community, all 17 bajillion uh, different alphabet soups out there. And this is their combined wisdom all in this wonderful report. Wow, look at it. It's so authoritative. And again, it's a report that, again, it's designed to, for the headlines that will be generated from this in the fake news media. But if you do click on it and just glance through it, it looks fairly authoritative. Look, it has fancy graphics and, ooh, the director of national intelligence and the intelligence community assessment and it has this fancy globe graphic and the always frustrating and annoying this page intentionally left blank that you always see on these government documents but there you go and if you just glance through it it looks like a lot of information and again there's some fancy graphics and things to show that they've uh, actually collected something in the the realm of data in here um uh, like, for example uh, about uh, the reach of RT as opposed to say the uh fake news like BBC and CNN and Al Jazeera. So it is interesting that some of the data that they collect there. But again, the more you actually read through this, the less impressive it actually is. Because once again, there is really no data whatsoever proving anything here. Now, of course, that's intentional because the intelligence community rarely can publicly reveal the full extent of its knowledge or the precise basis for its assessments, as the release of such information would reveal sensitive sources or methods and imperil the ability to collect critical and foreign intelligence in the future. Sources and methods, sources and methods, sources and methods. This is the eternal refrain of the intelligence community when they want to baffle you with BS. So, it is no surprise that they include absolutely not a shred of evidence of anything in here. They just talk about the well, the the overall influence campaign that, they, again, they say, they assert, came directly from Putin. But again, absolutely not sure of evidence of that. But fair enough. They're talking about the ways that outlets like RT have uh, clearly been out there to try to undermine American democracy. Well, uh, uh, it, it, the, the strange thing is in the appendix, the Annex A, where they talk about, for example, RT, um, they, they talk specifically about 2012, in the run-up to the 2012 election, and all of the analysis is centered on 2012. So they're talking about Breaking the Set and Truth Seeker, two, two shows that specifically do not air on RT anymore, and have not aired in the last year at least, so <laughs> had absolutely no effect on this current election. So for some reason, they're honing in on things from five years ago. But anyway, and uh, they're, they're honing in on such, oh, uh, unbelievable propaganda as... In an effort to highlight the alleged lack of democracy in the United States, RT broadcast hosted and advertised third-party candidate debates. <gasps> Shock, horror, and ran reporting supportive of the political agenda of these candidates. Oh my god! The RT hosts asserted that the U.S. two-party system does not represent the views of at least one-third of the population and is a sham. Well, my regular audience does not really need to be told that that is... In fact, just reporting of basic and verifiable and documentable reality. But apparently that, of course, is just beyond the pale. And again, now do not make this into a, oh, you're supporting RT. No, I am not. They are Russian-controlled, state-run media. Yes, fair enough. And anything they report has to be taken with that giant grain of salt in the exact same way that everybody constantly says that about, say, the BBC, right? Or NPR or VOA or any of those outlets. And, of course, CNN and those types of outlets are beyond reproach because that's private ownership, so they couldn't possibly be propaganda. I mean, again... Uh, it's one finger out, four fingers pointing back when you point your finger at someone. So, uh, yes, I agree, RT is state-run propaganda services, but that does not mean that things like this are incorrect. It is verifiable reality that there are third-party candidates and that the two-party system does not represent what most people believe. Um, anyway, uh, the, I do suggest you really do read through this report just so you get a sense of the absolutely zero 
evidence that they present in it, truly nothing, truly absolutely nothing. It's just, well, look at this, look at that. And it uh, is baffling with BS. But here's a particularly revealing part where they get to Annex B and they get to the estimative language because they want to show you that there's, oh, there's a process behind when, when they say nearly certain, almost certainly, very likely, roughly even, almost no chance. They're, you know, it's on this scale. Oh, it's a spectrum. Oh, it goes from red to blue. It's uh, so scientific looking. Uh, it must be, you know, based on something. Unless you, again, actually read what they are saying. Um, because uh, the, the language is almost comical here. Um, when they talk about uh, judgments, um, where where does it say this? Uh, 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 unless otherwise stated, the intelligence judgments are not derived via statistical analysis. Oh, here it is. Judgments are not intended to imply that we have proof that shows something to be a fact. Let me read that again. Judgments are not intended to imply that we have proof that shows something to be a fact. Assessments are based on collected information, which is often incomplete or fragmentary, as well as logic, argumentation, and precedence. Okay, fair enough. That is true. When you do try to put together information, it has to be based on incomplete and fragmentary uh, access to, to information, so it's logic, argumentation, and precedence. Fair enough. That is that is a proviso that is necessary to put. put. But that proviso should be in every single sentence where they are making assessments based on not data, not proof, not evidence, but on, well, logic shows that it would be in Russian interests to do this. No, that's not the way this is being portrayed in the media, and of course everyone knows it. Now, again, the more you actually read through what they are actually saying, the more you see that this is a ridiculous... It's not even a tissue of lies. It's just a tissue of statements that aren't even supported by... They, they don't even pretend are supported by evidence. So, we get to this part where, just the other day, State Department spokesperson John Kirby had the nerve to get up at a press conference and to state that for the intelligence community to actually reveal any evidence, any shred of evidence underlying this assessment that we're all supposed to take at face value would be, John Kirby's words, irresponsible. It would have been irresponsible for them uh, to have provided, uh, uh, to reveal that sort of information. And we rely on them as we should to make that determination for themselves in terms of what information was uh, appropriate to put out publicly. So again, evidence, providing evidence would be irresponsible irresponsible and we rely on the intelligence community as we should to police themselves about what evidence they can or cannot give out to the public us mere peons who have to take their pronouncements as facts despite logic argumentation and evidence as uh, they put it in that report showing that the intelligence community should not be relied on it was with high degree of confidence that the intelligence community said Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, which led to a disastrous war based on that false assessment. Do you think the public does not deserve to see the evidence in I, the case of Russia? I don't think I don't think many people uh, would doubt that uh, that the, the, the responsibility of the intelligence community to to protect sourcing sources and methods. Uh, I think most most American people understand that that uh, that they have a responsibility to protect that information uh, uh, for the future. Um, uh, and I don't think that uh, trying to compare what happened back in 2001 to uh, to this assessment is very relevant. Um, uh, <laughs> All right, I'll leave it there. Please do watch the whole clip. Of course, the clip, everything I cite is in the show notes. So please go and watch this whole clip. And he goes on and is questioned about it by another reporter who says, do you mean to say that we shouldn't, that, that, that what happened with the intelligence community and the WMD and the lead up to the war in Iraq we shouldn't take that into account? Are you really saying that? And he re reiterates it. Yeah, that's 15 years ago. It's a different context. The intelligence community has changed. Blah, blah, blah. So we can't we can't possibly look at such things and, and take that into account when we're taking judgments like this. Uh, I mean, we, that we t just have to accept at face value. Hmm. All right. So, uh... So we can't go back 15 years ago to look at, you know, world weapons of mass destruction or that kind of nonsense. So how about something much more recently where the intelligence community directly lied to Congress in direct violation of the laws of the land? And of course, absolutely nothing happened. So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, 
does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. Yeah, yeah, you remember that? Remember when General Clapper got up there and lied point blank 100% perjured himself about the uh, the NSA's illegal collection? That was only a few years ago. That wasn't 15 years ago. That wasn't ancient history. He flat out lied, perjured himself. It was illegal what he did here. And it later came out, of course, as we now know, yeah, the NSA really was collecting data on hundreds of millions of Americans. Oh, but... Has James Clapper been indicted yet? Dot com. Uh, has James Clapper been invited for, indicted for perjury yet? No. Nope. It's been 1,400 days and uh, since he lied to Congress. And no, he has not been indicted. So there you go. That's, that's how this justice works. But one wonders if that might be more relevant than if uh, we can't possibly look back 15 years to look at the false statements of the intelligence community. Can we look back a few? Um, Anyway, uh, on the note of Clapper, DNI, of course, now Clapper, um, and, uh, and his role in all of this, uh, there, uh, I would suggest people watch the full Senate hearing on rushing hacking, but I'll just throw in the link to Senator uh, Cotton uh, questioning him, where he points out some of the ridiculousness of all of this, including the vagueness of terms like Russia hacked the election, whatever that's supposed to mean. Of course, again, as they specifically state in their assessment, it does not mean that they have any... Uh, DHS assesses uh, uh, that the types of system the Russia's actors targeted to compromise were not involved in vote tallying. So uh, once again, for those who are hard of thinking, no, the Russia, they're not even alleging that Russia had anything to do with directly hacking the election. They are saying that there was some sort of influence campaign that somehow you know, brainwashed and mind-controlled American citizens to not, uh, n not uh, pull the lever for Hillary, as, as everyone was going to do, right? Uh, okay, uh, let's bring in some other context. To, uh, about this as well. Election interference? Yep, the U.S. has done it in 45 countries worldwide, and that's only in the last uh, nine, uh, 70 years or so since the end of World War II. Um, this is talking about some new research that's, uh, that's come out uh, by a political scientist uh, documenting different times in which different countries have meddled in foreign elections and identifying from 1946 to 2000, America uh, fiddled in 45 different countries' elections, including not only in the Western Hemisphere, where, of course, we all know they have the manifest destiny to rule every square inch of this part of the world, but also in the Eastern uh, hemisphere where they, uh, they uh, where they were interfering in all sorts of places, Romania and uh, Somalia and Sri Lanka and Thailand and Ukraine. And oh yeah, Rus Russia, by the way, interfered in Russia. Now, if you want to get the underlying data from which this comes, uh, here is a link to the actual research uh, itself from Carnegie Mellon University, Partisan Electoral Interventions by the Great Powers, introducing the PEIG data set, which is looking at US and USSR, Russia, uh, meddling in foreign elections between 1946 and 2000. So it's not a partisan source here. Um, and it, it has a data set behind it that uh, you can actually find the methodology, how they collected the data, what kind of data they collected. And you can look at some of the different figures they come up with. And again, this is comparing the U.S. Uh, meddling as well as Russian slash Soviet meddling in foreign countries' elections. But here's an interesting figure, figure four, the com comparison of U.S. and USSR slash Russia electoral interventions by decade from 1946 to 2000. And in every single part of this graph, except here in the 70s, so there's a little bit of a dip here where Russia actually was more active in meddling in foreign elections, but the U.S. in every single other part of this uh, this terrain was much more influential, much more uh, meddling in foreign countries. So yes, the U.S. constantly meddles in other elections, and now here we have this hysteria over Russia's uh, meddling. Again, none of this is a defense of Russia or the Russian government or any of the actions of the Russian government or RT or Sputnik or any of these uh, different uh, players that are being indicated here. But it is just an absolute mind-boggling thing to watch people on the left side of the spectrum who have spent decades, if not their entire existence, railing against the intelligence community, now saying, why isn't, why isn't, why aren't people taking the intelligence community more seriously, guys? We've got to believe them. It is not fundamentally surprising, but it is still an amazing thing to behold, to watch people really and truly contort themselves into whatever position is necessary to fit the square peg in the round hole to, in order to maintain their beliefs. Cognitive bias is a hell of a drug.
So, probably the best way to confront this is not to, well, I mean, actually, yes, go and read these documents, but I know no one's actually going to go and actually read the documents for themselves. So, the best way to confront it is to simply put it in plain English. They are trying to tell you that the Russians tried to rig the election by exposing how the DNC tried to rig the election. That is the fundamental ludicrous scenario that we're actually that, that's being force-fed to us in the 24/7 news cycle right now. And again, I, I really, truly hope that this is gone in a couple of weeks and this is yesterday's news, but they are clearly trying to make this into something more and they are going to use this to make DHS to, uh, ultimately take national federal control over the elections and that's where this is heading. And, uh, you know, it's just more of the, uh, the old, old never-ending selection circus that will keep people constantly focused on the powers that shouldn't be and what's happening in Washington, D.C., as opposed to things that they can actually do in their own life. So let's get rid of this, uh, this whole sham, the whole sham, the, the whole process itself is just 100% ridiculous, ludicrous, and it boils down to ludicrous nonsense. All of the show notes, all of the uh, all of the things that I've talked about today will be in the show notes. I'll uh, direct you there as always. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.